Good. All right. So, so last time uh, we talked about the fall. So, um, let's just review. What happened with the fall? Like Adam and Eve and the whole. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> Whole garden thing, all that. What took place? What was? What were the ramifications? Sin entered the world. Sin entered the world, and when that happened, what did that do? The guilt of sin. Because we don't receive their guilt, but we are sinners. Yeah. So it's the ancestral. Mm hmm So we could describe it in terms of a sickness, an illness. Oh mm -hmm. yes. That's passed on from generation to generation. So now we have the affects capacity. Us. The capacity. And, and one of the ways that that's seen in our life is death. Right? Death. Oh, we became mortal in that fall. We could say that we had the potential. God created us with the potential to be immortal or to be mortal. It depended on our choice. And we made the choice that led to death and mortality. And we say the wages of sin is death, and really what that means is that you have, if you have the sickness, it will eventually manifest itself, and it will, it's terminal. It's a terminal sickness. That's what we say. Right? So everybody, so the little child who's born isn't guilty of Adam's sin, but because he carries the sickness, he will eventually manifest all the symptoms that will lead to death. Yeah? So, um, now, I want to read some things that I think might be helpful for us. Thank you. This is uh, Father Dumitru Staniloya, who is a 20th century Romanian theologian. And um, listen to what he writes. In paradise, Adam could see with a mind that was full of love, with a soul filled with the power of the Divine Spirit. And this not only because he himself was completely unified, but also because he lived in a creation that was full of the Divine Spirit. No separation existed between creation and the world of the Divine Energies. No contradiction among the tendencies of man. No separation between these and the higher Divine Powers. Adam had opened before him the endless dimensions of these depths and was able with no difficulty to remain on the steps leading toward the good. Creation, opening up as it did on the infinite, protected him from being cornered in any way and did not seem a narrow, enclosed reality to the human person. Because it was associated with rationality, creation spread wide its dimensions to their fullest meaning, for human existence had not yet been cut back by death. For those who raise themselves in Christ from this narrowness of creation, death does not have the last word. Existence is extended beyond death into the infinite. For them, rationality acquires its full meaning, and so does existence. They see the assurance that they will continue eternally in virtue of the worth of their own person, which they feel. The eternal value of the human person is assured by the fact that the supreme basis itself of existence is the human being's partner in eternal communion sorry, as the human being's partner in eternal communion and love, is personal in character. The return of a human being to communion with God delivers him from eternal death. By renouncing communion with God and with his fellow humans, the human being has limited his knowledge to knowledge of the world as object. He has grown weak in knowledge of the divine subject who is superior to the world, that's God. For knowledge of the divine subject comes about through communion with God and never gives man the possibility of being sovereign over him. In wishing to know everything in a completely or merely rational manner, the human being is left with only that aspect of the world and of the human body that understands humans as objects. Left with a narrowly rational knowledge of nature and his fellow humans, the human being has a detached knowledge from the understanding of creation as the gift of God and from the love of God, as the one who is continuously bestowing creation as gift, providing the human being with his neighbors as partners in a dialogue of love. So what this is saying is, um, he, he's saying that um, because of the choice 
to know the world in a particular way which is separated from communion with God, we come into a state where we see the whole world differently. And this is what's described as the darkening of the mind. Um, and what it means is that we, we, rather than seeing other people as subjects and as, um, you know, seeing, seeing them as having infinite value, images of God, you know, seeing, seeing them as um, having the divine in them, for example. Um, instead, we start to see people as objects um, from whom we can gain somehow, you know. So it, it changes the way we look at the world, um, changes our relationship with God and with other people. Now, he says, um, relying on some of uh, what certain of the fathers wrote, that he talks about the tree. You have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And he says at least one interpretation of that that you find in the tradition or one way of speaking of it is that actually um, both of them uh, represent knowledge, but knowledge in a different way. The tr they're, they're both, you could say, the world itself, because the world has the potential to be the vehicle through which we know God or to be an object in and of itself that leads us away from God and becomes an idol. So he says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is knowledge of good and evil apart from God, um, and that's knowing the world in that particular way, which is the fallen way of knowing the world. Um, but the tree of life would be to know the world as connecting us with God, and then it's, it's life-giving. Everything becomes life-giving. Our sacraments are that way. That's exactly what we see in the sacramental life, is that physical things that God has created, and He created good in the first place, but which we have put to a bad use, are now restored to their purpose, and they connect us with God. So you have water, you have oil, and you have bread, and you have wine, you know, all of which could be polluted, uh, you know, exploited, used, abused, um, um, treated as an object that we want to control or through which we control others, you know. Um, but in the sacraments of the church, they're all restored to their purpose of being means of communion with God. In them we see God. In them we know God. So, that's one way of looking at it. Another way of understanding the trees are, um, again, uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil being broken communion with God, knowing the world without God, um, but the tree of life, him, in our hymnography, the cross is called the tree of life. So it's, and, and that's because it's through the cross that we're restored to that right way of knowing God. You see, everything then becomes about communion with Him. Um, I always think of, when I, th when I think of this whole idea of knowing God in different ways, having communion with Him or breaking communion with Him, I think of the story of the prodigal son parable of the prodigal son. Are you all familiar? You know the story, the prodigal son. So, um, the younger son says, give me my inheritance to his father. And this is like saying, I don't care about you, I just want your stuff. I want my inheritance and then I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I don't want to see you anymore. That's what the younger son says. And this is exactly what, we, what sin does. It's saying, rather than wanting a relationship with you, Lord, I just want to enjoy all this stuff on my own terms, in my own way, you know? I don't want to have you telling me what to do with it, or how I, how I should uh, use it, or not use it, and so on. So we're, this is what we're effectively saying to God, I want your stuff, I don't want you. Until we come to our senses and return to Him. And that's what our salvation is all about. <clears throat> now, um, what did God do after um, Adam and Eve sinned? He, you know, in the language of Genesis, what does it say He does? What's His response to Adam and Eve after they sin? He asked them why he first. Asked them why. So what is that? Why does He ask them why? He doesn't know. He knows. He, he has to ask them, where are you? Right? Yeah. Where are you, Adam? He said, I'm hiding because I found him naked. Yeah. Well, he starts to make excuses, right? Oh, I'm naked. He, where are you, means like, 
what's going on. Mm -hmm. Now's your opportunity. He could have confessed, he could have repented, but he didn't. Instead, he starts making excuses. No problem. Well, um, I saw that we saw that we were naked, so we, we hid ourselves. Well, why are you naked, Adam? <laughs> you know, who told you? who told you you're naked, right? Right. Um, because they were clothed in innocence and God's glory before, and now they are indeed naked of that. They've lost it. Um, but this this is from this fallen way of understanding the world that they see themselves naked and, and they want to hide. This is what we do. We try to hide. Um, but God is calling to them and saying, here's an opportunity. I still love you. Just, But you have to come clean. You have to be open. You have to be willing to have a relationship. Um, but then, of course, he's, then he says, um, you know, have you eaten of the fruit? Yeah. The woman you gave me made me do it. It's her fault, and by the way, it's your fault, because you made her, right? Mm -hmm. So he's pointing fingers at everybody else except himself. He doesn't take responsibility, the opposite of what he was supposed to do, tragically. And then what does the Lord do? He asks the woman. He what? He asks the woman. Yeah, and then she blames the serpent. And then what? In the language of Scripture, there's a curse. What's the curse? Childbirth. She'll, she'll be, have painful childbirth. And what about Adam? He has to work by sweating his brow, and there'll be thorns and thorns thistles. Thorns and thistles, and, thistles and It'll be hard. life will be full of suffering. So that's, that's it. I mean, life is full of suffering for men and women. And Okay. And then they're cast out of the garden, and angels are there with, um, this, you know, this is the cherubim, and there's a flaming sword. In other words, it's their blocks from entering back in to the garden. So people see in this is God's punishment. You know, He's cursing them. He's punishing them. He's um, k kicking them out. You know, this kind of thing. But listen to what um, Father Demetrius says here. In general, the tragic state of the world after the fall is not the result of any act of God, but exclusively the result of Adam's deed. In no way, therefore, is this state of suffering and death to be deemed a punishment imposed by God upon Adam. God, as love, is always acting with love, and love creates no evil whatsoever. Adam's slavery is the natural consequence of his being vanquished. His suffering is the physiological result of the trauma he himself sustained when he turned aside from his path, and death follows upon alienation from God. To regard God as the cause of suffering and death is an essential error, a real affront offered to him. So teriologically, which means according to salvation, it is also genuinely heretical, for it strips the cross of Christ of its real hist historical and anthropological content, which is that of victory over Satan, and makes it a simple instrument of suffering and the placating of God's wrath, quote-unquote. Um, so what this is saying is that um, what we often speak of in terms of punishment or of curse, and even the Old Testament uses that language, um, we have to keep in mind that there is what we call anthropomorphism going on in that. That that's <clears throat> from our experience that if something bad happens, it must be a punishment, you know? It must, and so God's wrath. And we talked a long time ago about not a long time ago, a number of sessions ago, about um, God's wrath. How do we understand that? Um, and certainly, uh, we don't understand that as a description of a change that takes place in God. Like sometimes he's in a good mood, sometimes he's in a bad mood. You know, today he's happy, tomorrow he's going to be full of wrath. You know, we we um, do something wrong and he gets really mad. He's ticked off and he's kicking stuff and throwing thunderbolts and no. That's ridiculous, you know, that's projecting our fallen experience on God. So then what is it, this language of, of wrath or um, God's punishment or whatever? It's simply God allowing the consequences that follow from our breaking away from Him, turning our backs on Him, rejecting Him, allowing us to suffer those until such time as He can bring us back. Just like with the prodigal son. Did the father punish the prodigal son? No, he punished himself. 
He took all that, he squandered it, he wasted it, he ended up in the pig's pen. That was his punishment. Punishment. The father make that happen? He allowed it because he, had, he, he allowed him to have free will. He let him go. He didn't force him to stay. And that's exactly what God does with us. The punishment is what we do to ourselves when we try to live without God. We make ourselves crazy and we hurt each other and all this stuff. It all comes from living in darkness. But there's the sun. Is some, does somebody, if somebody closes their eyes, is it the sun's fault that they can't see? No. The sun is still there. That's what the Lord says in the Gospel. He, the, he, you know, he says, God makes the sun to shine on the just and the unjust, and the rain falls on the just and the unjust, you know? It's not, it's not you know, really punishing the one, and no, but we do this to ourselves. So, that's, that's important to keep in mind when we talk about this whole uh, story of our fall. It's our rejection of God which leads to us being in darkness. Okay, now, and last time we talked about the, the noose, the mind being darkened, and the heart, and the intellect, and, and what happens in all of that. And so, um, picking up with that, we could say that when we are spiritually blinded by sin, with our mind darkened, our heart hard and corrupt, and the intellect going uh, wild without any spiritual guidance, that's what happens. You know, the mind is racing and we're thinking of things, but there's no order to it. There's no, there's no purpose to it. Um, th there's no guidance by, from, from the spirit. Um, and we become enslaved to the flesh. The symptoms of this state are described with the word passions. And this is what the fathers talk about. Um, they, you, you read this a lot about the passions. And this is with a negative uh, connotation. Now, if you talk about the passion and singular, what are we talking about? Christ. Yeah, the cross. Is that, what does the word mean? Passion. Suffering. suffering, yeah, it means suffering. So um, it's something that you suffer. So when we we talk about the passion, um, we mean the Lord's passion usually when we say that, and we mean what He suffered on the cross out of His love for us. But the passions are things that we suffer in our illness. So they're, um, we could say, natural faculties gone awry, <laughs> gone haywire. They don't work right anymore. So we talked about the, the three powers of the soul. So for example, the, um, um, what we call the appetitive power, the desiring faculty of the soul. God put that in you. He gave you the ability to desire. That's good. But in our fallen state, it becomes corrupted, and we start desiring all kinds of things that are not good. Right? I mean, it doesn't make sense that God would make us so that we desire things that are unhealthy for our body. Why would He design us like that? Obviously, something's gone haywire. Why, why would He desire something that's contrary to what's moral and what's good, you know? Why would He, you know, make, he obviously He didn't. But that doesn't mean that desiring is evil, it means that our ability to desire has become corrupted and we desire the wrong things and at the wrong times and the wrong amounts and, you know, we, we compulsively desire things that are not good for us. Um, same thing with what we call the insensitive power of the soul. That's, that's where zeal comes from, you know, the strength to follow through and do what needs to be done and uh, anger comes from that. And, you know, to be angry against evil and against Satan and, you know, all of that's good. You know, God created us with that ability to, to fight against evil. But it becomes corrupted and then pretty soon, I don't know, Cain and his siblings are fighting each other and Cain and Abel are killing each other. You know, all this, that's the insensitive faculty gone haywire. It's n not being used for God's purpose anymore. So this is what happens. All these things go crazy. So 
So all the passions, and there, some of the fathers have really long lists of them, but they all come from these basic three powers of the soul, the, the intelligent, um, insensitive, and appetitive powers of the soul that have been corrupted. Um, now, St. John of Damascus gives a nice um, kind of breakdown of how, um, what, what passions come from each of these aspects of the soul. So related to the intelligent aspect of the soul, um, which is supposed to be guided by the noose, but when the noose is in a darkened state, this is what happens. So our reason, um, our, our intelligent aspect of the soul uh, is corrupted, and from that comes unbelief, heresy, blasphemy, so we're, we're using our mind wrongly. Ingratitude. We could add pride and, and all the, all the um, sins that are associated with pride or related to pride, like um, vainglory and um, uh, ambition. When it's ambition can be a passion. And you care more about your ambitions than God or anyone else, you know, um, uh, etc. Then from, from the insensitive aspect of the soul, or the insensitive power, and that's the one that's supposed to manifest itself as zeal for God, um, but when it becomes corrupted, um, it, it can go to either of uh, the extremes. Um, either uh, we have this kind of misguided zeal that ends up damaging people, or we, we have a lack of zeal um, that causes us to be weak. So a lack of courage, St. John of Damascus says. Lack of courage, being, being fearful, but also hatred. Um, envy. Lack of compassion, just not caring, etc. And then from the appetitive, ap like appetites, that word, from the appetitive faculty comes, of course, gluttony, which is like making an idol of, f of food. Greed, drunkenness, he says. Basically trying to satisfy ourselves with stuff or through relationships with people, lust, um, and love of pleasure, wealth, etc. All those things. Some of the fathers also um, simply, rather than breaking it into these three groupings according to the powers of the soul, they, they talk about passions of the soul like pride and laziness and passions of the body like gluttony and sexual immorality. But you have to recognize that really all these passions um, come about through the soul. The body is never to be blamed for the passions. body has natural needs, you know. The, the body doesn't really want to feed itself too much alcohol doesn't you know that's that's something going on in the soul that causes that to happen saint maximus the confessor points the way to the healing of these three powers of the soul in christ he says this bridle your soul's insensitive power with love quench its desire the appetitive power gone awry with self-control and give wings to its intelligence with prayer and the light of your noose will never be darkened. That's from St. Maximus the Confessor. And that's in that um, uh, retreat uh, given by my dad, uh, where he talks about the three powers of the soul that one of these days we're going to get copies of and give you all to listen to. Um, that's basically what he says. He says, for, for these three um, powers of the soul that have gone haywire, um, the church gives us, God gives us through the church and in, in, 
in his wisdom, he gives us uh, prayer, which purifies the, the noose and the intellect. Um, he gives us um, almsgiving, mercy, showing mercy to others, which purifies our insensitive power, and fasting, which purifies the appetitive power of the soul. Okay. We're going to begin um, now talking about our understanding of who Jesus is. Do you all remember in the Gospel um, when the Lord's with His disciples and He starts asking them, Who do men say that I am? Or what do they say? Some say you are John the Baptist, you Right. Elijah, did they say some say you are John the Baptist, some say you are Elijah. Yeah. What else? We, and we could add to what they say. What? Who do people say Jesus is? He's a good, he's a good man. Right. He's a prophet. Good man, prophet. The chosen. The chosen. Yeah. Just a good teacher. Just a good teacher. Historical figure, mm -hmm. kind of like Gandhi or something. Nice guy. Yeah. Okay, we're back to his hometown. Let's just, let's just Joseph's son. Let's just the carpenter's son. Right. Yeah. Nobody special. We know him. We know his family. What? He's not, he can't be the Messiah. Right. And then the Lord says to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? And what does Peter say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but it comes from the Father, my Heavenly Father. Okay, so this is the essential confession of the Christian faith. That Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. That He is the Word incarnate, the Word become flesh, just like it says at the beginning of John's Gospel. John beautifully um, describes the Lord's coming into the world in terms of the Word which became flesh. So, um, there are all these claims in the world uh, by different people about who Jesus is, and um, what matters most for us is um, with all our heart knowing and believing that He is uh, the one He claims to be and that countless um, Christians throughout all the generations since the beginning of the Church have believed Him to be. And this makes, uh, it really makes a huge difference for us, it makes all the difference in the world whether He's the one or the other, whether He's the Son of the Living God, or just a good teacher. Now, of course, C.S. Lewis makes the great point that if he were just a good teacher, we'd have a big problem, because good teachers don't go around claiming to be the Son of God, right? Because then he'd be lying to us, right? He says, either he was a liar, or a lunatic, or the Lord. Those are the only possibilities, because um, either he was purposely deceiving us, in which case he's a liar, or he believed he was the Son of God, in which case he's a lunatic if he's not really the Son of God, or he really is the Lord. So, he says, don't give me any of that. That can't be. He can't be a good teacher if he's claiming this. Um, and of course, um, it's the reality of Jesus' divinity, his divine humanity, we say, he's both God and man, um, that makes our salvation possible. And St. Athanasius the Great, uh, writing in his book On the Incarnation, he makes the wonderful um, point that he, the, his argument is basically, and somebody was just telling me, I was saying this the other day, and somebody said, Lee Strobel's, or what's his name? You know that guy who makes the case for Christ? He wrote the case for Christ. He makes the same point, but St. Athanasius made it 1,700 years ago. Um, he says, we know for sure that this man, Jesus Christ, 
really died and rose from the dead. How do we know? Because of the martyrs. Because nothing else could inspire countless martyrs to die for him. If it were just a story, they wouldn't have the strength to do that. It has to be real. That's, I mean, for him, that's just, that's it. That's definitive. Because the martyrs are willing to die for Christ generation after generation, he knows that's the power of the resurrection alive in them, inspiring them, making it possible for them to do the same. He would have to be the apostles would be dying for a lie. Because yeah. if Jesus is crazy, that's one thing. They're all, yeah, they if all Jesus is crazy, to... they're all dying for something insane. Right. Exactly. Because they were right. saying, we saw, we witnessed right. him. And, they would have, and none of them made money. In fact, they all lost yeah. um, everything in their lives. Right. You know, being a reputation of, you know, Paul gave up everything. He, would, he was the rising star among the Pharisees. Right. And so his testimony is that he saw Jesus, that Jesus commissioned himself, and so he would have to be dying for a lie. Right. And generation after generation of Christians, and, and I mean, it was exploding throughout the Mediterranean world. You know, you have believers coming to belief in Christ, and they would it would all be, f I mean, just for this nice story? No. You can't, Buddhists, can't Buddhists and um, Muslims say the same thing, though? Like, they they died for their faith, and Muhammad believed what he... So that was my line, because I like that argument at first as well. But, yeah. um, but and, Or like that, not Harry Krishnas, whoever it is, like cult leaders... People will die for them. All those people like died together. Mm -hmm. Maybe that they got caught up in a spaceship. So I don't. It can sound similar. So I don't know if that's the best argument with people. Yeah, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But the point is really. Um, I mean that. Sure. I think it may not be convincing for everybody, but I think from a Christian perspective, I mean, we we simply don't believe. Yeah, okay, maybe some group here or some group there gets deceived and, you know, they, they give up their life or whatever for a cult leader. Um, but we're talking about something that's consistently continued for 2,000 years. And for St. Athanasius, it was enough by his time that in the, in the 4th century, this was something that was continuing. Um, and, and really, I mean, seeing how the martyrs die also, that they die victoriously, joyfully, praying for their tormentors, you know, um, I think that was also, that converted people. And that's why Tertullian said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Every time a martyr was killed, all, you know, hundreds and thousands of more people became Christians from seeing him die, you know, not because they were promised something, no, but because they saw the power of Christ at work in them. Um, so I think that's really what he's saying is that, yeah, and if you if you don't believe in Christ, it might not be a convincing argument. But if you do believe in Christ, you see that it makes all the difference in the world whether he did or didn't, whether he's divine or not. Um, and certainly, I think we see the fruit of uh, people believing that he's just um, a good teacher, um, even in a lot of faith organizations, you know, denominations, that kind of thing. Where, um, okay, I mean, we're going to live one kind of way if we really believe that he rose from the dead in another kind of way if we just don't think that's necessary. Because there are people who consider themselves Christians who don't think that's necessary, who, who don't confess that he rose from the dead, who don't confess the virgin birth, you know, who just say that was all made up. So, um... There's more of those churches than you realize. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially since the 20th century... So, um, we believe that Jesus Christ is fully God. He's the divine Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, and at the same time, He's totally human. So, He's fully God and fully man. He's, a per he's perfect God and perfect man. And we are modeled after His humanity. And so, um, now what we're going to do is just go through and try to understand uh, what these claims mean and talk about um, the different titles and names that refer to Jesus Christ and how we understand them. So first of all, there's um, our understanding that Christ is the Messiah. The Messiah. This is what Christ means. So the, the Hebrew word is Messiah. 
in the Greek word is Christ, Christ or Christos. Christos. And by the way, if you say Christos with the accent on the os, that's only Jesus Christ. But people can have the name Christos. Greeks, yeah. That's, that's a common Greek name, Christos. Presbyteras, both of her um, uh, grandfathers, both had the name Christos. So, um, Christos means Messiah. It means um, the anointed one. That's what both Messiah and Christos mean. Anointed. Throughout uh, the Old Testament, we have this term, this language about the Messiah, this anointed one. Um, and there were various anointed ones in the Old Testament. So, for example, the kings, beginning with Saul and then David, they were anointed to be king. So there's this tradition that um, through that pouring of oil on the head of a person, that person is called by God and strengthened and enabled for a particular role. So the kings were anointed, the priests were anointed, um, and the prophets were anointed. So there's, for kings, priests, and prophets, there's this process of becoming that by being anointed. So there was this, um, this sense that that's, that's what we do. We, we anoint people for their ministry. But, at the same time, there was this idea that there would be one very special anointed one, the anointed one, the, the one who would be anointed by God beyond what anybody else has ever been anointed. Um, and so that was the, the Messiah, and that he would be the perfect prophet, priest, and king, right? He would fulfill those roles. So the Psalms speak of this one as the Messiah or the Christ in several places. For example, Psalm 2 says, the, king of the, earth, the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers gathered themselves together against the Lord and against his Christ or his anointed, saying, let us break through their bonds and cast away their yoke from us, and so on. Elsewhere, in uh, Psalm 110, for example, it says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. From the womb before the morning star, and, and that morning star is actually Lucifer. Lucifer. From the womb before Lucifer, the morning star, I have begotten you. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is understood to be a, um, a messianic prophecy or a reference to the Messiah. So you have this Messiah who is going to be the perfect priest, king, and uh, prophet. And you have this language in the Psalms about how the Lord is beginning him before Lucifer. And this is really an answer to um, the, uh, the idea that Jesus is part of God's creation you know, that he's simply a created being, like some people have claimed, um, as opposed to, as we understand the scripture to be saying, that he's from God, begotten, not made, before he even started making the angels, before Lucifer, who is, we could say, the, the, the brightest of the angels. Okay. The prophetic books like Isaiah are especially full of references to the Messiah and prophecies about him. Isaiah is considered to be, um, some people call it the fifth gospel, because it's so full of prophecies about the Messiah. Um, and according to some scholars, the Old Testament has at least 450 prophecies of Christ. And, uh, you know, that's, we could probably find more from an Orthodox perspective, because we see everything basically as referring to Christ. When the Lord asks the disciples whom they say that he is, Peter responds, you are the Christ, the Messiah, he's saying. You are that one, the one that we read about. You're that one, you're, you're the son of man that Daniel talks about. You're, you're the suffering servant that Isaiah talks about. You know, all these things that are referring to the Messiah, you're that, the son of a living God. 
And this is the confession and belief of the church, inspired by God, as the Lord says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but it's inspired by God. Um, and it's the confession of all faithful Christians throughout the ages. So, he is the Messiah. He's also the Logos. How do we translate that? Word. Of course, um, as is often the case, when you translate something, you lose some things, you lose some of the meaning. So Logos can also be translated as um, things like reason, purpose, um, the, sort of like the, the um, um, final cause, something like that, you know? Principle. The principle. The what? Unifying principle. Unifying principle, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The principle, that which gives things their, their meaning. It gives meaning to the world. Um, so the logos of things would be, uh, you know, sort of like the meaning of things. So what's, so you know, the, the logos of this eraser would be its purpose, you know, to erase, you know, something like that. Well, we say that he's, he's the, the, the purpose of the world. He's the meaning, he's the unifying principle, the underlying reality of all things. So there, there are, you could talk about logi, like, you know, the meanings of different things, but the, the logos, capital, that's Christ. He is the one. So the word, and this is um, in St. John's Gospel again, this is what it's talking about, the Logos, um, was with God, right? And the word was God, right? So it's not just that, you know, God has this word and the word is something else, but the word is actually God himself. Of course, we understand that in terms of the persons, the Father and the Son. The Son is the Word. So we know Christ as the Messiah who fulfills all the prophecies, and we know Him as the Word of God. And as we've said before, whenever God speaks in the Old Testament, He speaks through His Word. It's His Word speaking. So the burning bush, that's Christ. That's why we, we put the, the existing one, or the O'on, um, I am, on the icon of Christ. Because... I am that I am, right. Or just for short, I am. So Jesus Christ is the one who speaks in the burning bush and on Mount Sinai. Anytime God speaks in the Old Testament, that's the word. Um, in Hebrew, I mentioned this uh, in, in the church, the word, word is dabar. Which um, can be translated also as something like substance, thing, matter, um, reality, something like that. So, um, St. John's Gospel gives us this account of Christ as this. Now, then of course, there's the name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? God mm -hmm. So... It's from the Hebrew name Yeshua, which is also Joshua. It's the same name. So, um, Jesus actually, our English word Jesus comes from the Greek, Jesus, which is a, a Hellenization or a Greekified version of the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua. Um, so you find, for example, in like if... If you, you might find some translations of the Old Testament uh, from the Septuagint, the Greek, where that's actually Jesus in the Old Testament. Because it's the same name, actually. Um, so, um, in the Old Testament, Joshua was the leader who led the Israelites into the Promised Land. So you see the significance of that. Um, his name is in a sense, a reference back to that, or you could say he's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the Joshua in the Old Testament. And the name itself means God saves. So it's connected with the title of Savior. Of course, that's also given to him in the Gospel. 
the savior of the world. Which, of course, if you understand that in Greek, it can also mean healer. Because it's the same word in Greek. It's synonymous. So he's the savior of the world and he's also the healer of the world. Um, we call him the Lord. And this is a name that's familiar from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in Hebrew, um, there's this word... Mm, Adon or Adonai, which means Lord, or is translated as Lord, um, to refer to God. And um, one reason why that's often used is because you can't, because the, the, for the Jews, this understanding that you don't use the, the name of the Lord in vain, like I was talking about today, meant that you would not even pronounce this, the, it's, which is like, in, in Hebrew, they don't put the vowels in. So even scholars argue about how this was supposed to be pronounced, but I think most people agree that it's probably something like Yahweh, if you've heard that before. But Jehovah was a version of that. If you've ever heard like the Jehovah's Witnesses, that was a, it, there was a particular time when... Um, uh, like the Germans, scholars were looking at the Hebrew, and that's how they thought it ought to be pronounced. Because if you, because this could also be like a just sound, and that could be like a v sound. And if you fill in the the vowels like ja o a, then it'll be Jehovah. Anyway, that um, came from German. Yeah, I think it, I think if I remember right, it was it was uh, the, this German biblical scholarly school that came up with that. Um, so it's just really a mispronunciation of that the name of God, which is you know like the I am, um, which the Jews were very careful not to even pronounce. Um, so they would have it written, but they wouldn't say it, and instead they would say this which means Lord. That was like the fill-in for that. So, it, it, like in the um, uh, King James authorized version, a lot of times you see it in all caps. The Lord, like that. That's, that's how they render that. Now, um, Lord is given as a title to Jesus in the New Testament. And of course, in Greek, that's um, Kyrios. Like we say, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, Kyrios. Now, that could be, it could just mean um, like master or mister, you know, kind of like a title of respect for somebody. But we see it very, very clearly being used in this sense, the way it was used for God in the Old Testament, when um, Thomas... Um, sees the Lord in the end of St. John's Gospel, and he says, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. He's saying, he's confessing him as that one. You are that one. Okay. And of course, it's, it's just used a lot just to refer to him. We have seen the Lord, you know, the, like the myrrh-bearing women say to the disciples. We have seen the Lord. The Lord is risen. Um, okay, he's called Son of Man. Right? Um, he even refers to himself as that. But this is a reference back to the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, you have this um, person referred to, the Son of Man, who is clearly a divine Messiah. And the title, the, the idea is, it has, has the sense of somebody who's born into the human race, but is special, you know, is the Messiah. Comes into the human race, so is the son of Adam, in other words, son of man means son of Adam, um, but he's not like all the other sons of Adam. However, it does emphasize the Lord's humanness. So we, we say son of man, um, we could say that, it emphasizes 
the fact that he's this human messiah, but we also say son of God, which emphasizes his divinity. Now another um, title um, that we use that comes from, really it's in uh, Romans um, chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, um, and then it refers back to Genesis, is calling Christ the new Adam or the second Adam. And this idea is closely related to um, the idea of the Son of Man. So again, he, the fact that he's the Son of Man and the fact that he's the new Adam or second Adam, both of these titles are saying that he is fulfilling Adam's calling. What Adam was supposed to be, Jesus is. At what Adam failed to be, Jesus shows us what, what he was meant to be. He fulfills that. So St. Paul uses that language, and um, the Son of Man is really saying the same thing. Okay. How about the Lamb of God? Who refers to Jesus as the Lamb of God? John the Baptist. He says, he sees him coming, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does that mean? Sacrifice. What's that? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. That's exactly right. Um, what, what, what was the, where was the Lamb in the Old Testament? Yeah. And, and what about, there was one special lamb that was offered once a year, right, the Passover. So there were lots of sacrifices offered throughout the year for different purposes and all of that. But um, the, there was one unblemished lamb, you know, perfect, unspotted, unblemished, that was meant to be offered as the Passover sacrifice. And that's specifically what this means that He is that Passover sacrifice. Jesus, our Passover, He is our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Christ our Passover, St. Paul says. Or Pascha, right? So that's... Pascha is the Greek... Just like Jesus is the Greek version of Yeshua, Pascha is the Greek version of Pesach. That's the Hebrew word, which means... In English, we say Passover, but it's Pesach or Pascha. He thought I was saying pasta. Pasta? No, yeah. I heard you right. Yeah, now, okay. we, we really like pasta in the Orthodox Church. Right. It's great. Spaghetti and, you yeah. know. No, it's Pascha, pa Pesach, Passover. By the way, you know, in the, in the Passover account in Exodus, you know where the Lord... God commands the people to take that spotless lamb and by sacrificing this lamb and then what do they do with the blood to protect themselves? They put it on the door, right? Where? The door jams and the lintel. That's what it is. They put blood in the shape of a cross over their door. So it's a foreshadowing. Um, in Colossians chapter 1, St. Paul calls Jesus the icon. Did you say Colossians? Yeah. He says he's the image of the invisible God. So we could say he's the perfect icon of God of the Father. In Him we see the Father. He says to Philip, Have I been with you so long? Do you not know that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father? So He's, he's the icon of God. He's also called elsewhere the, the express image or icon. 
Um, he's referred to as the rock from which the water flows in 1 Corinthians 10.4. St. Paul uses all these images from the Old Testament. So that's a reference to Exodus, when they didn't have any water, and they prayed to God, and God told Moses to hit the rock with a stick, and the water flowed from it. So St. Paul uses that image to describe Christ. He's the rock from which the water flows, 1 Corinthians 10.4. I already mentioned Son of God, and that's in multiple places throughout um, the Scripture. For example, 1 John chapter 5 calls Him the Son of God. Also, St. Paul calls Him, and we have this in the Gospel where the Lord speaks of Himself this way, the Bridegroom, right? Metropolitan Isaiah was talking about this last night, if you were there at Vespers. He, um, so they come to him and they say, Why do your disciples not fast? The disciples of John fast. The Pharisees fast. They keep the fast. They have fast days. They're doing what they're supposed to. And your disciples are disregarding it. He said, While the bridegroom is with his friends, they don't fast. But when he goes away, they'll fast. So he's calling himself the bridegroom. Um, and uh, St. John the Baptist speaks of himself as the friend of the bridegroom. And St. Paul talks about um, the church and Ephesians being the bride, and Christ is the bridegroom. So, he's also called the head of the church. It's a different analogy, but if you, if you talk about the church as the body, then Christ is the head. Head of the church. Um, he's, he's spoken of in our tradition, of course, as the second person of the Trinity. So you have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he's the Son, Son of God, scriptural, um, but we, we call him um, the Son in this Trinitarian context. And we also have and this is not specifically a biblical term, but it's a term that synthesizes Scripture. Um, he's called the Theanthropos in our theology. That means the God-man. God, the God-man. Because he's both God and man. So he's the only one like that in, anywhere, right? He's, he's the only Theanthropos. We are anthropi, we're men. God is Theos, Jesus Christ is God-man, the Anthropos. He's spoken of um, in Colossians 2.9 this way, In Him dwells all the fullness of God bodily. So He contains the fullness of God in His body. Okay. I don't know, watch. I thought when he calls himself the way. The way? Yep. There are, there are many, many more. Um, this is just a sampling, some of the most common ones. But yep, he calls himself the way, truth, and the life, right? And also he refers to himself as the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. Yep. Well, what else? Thing, when we talk about the way, um, the other people would say, well, there's other ways to God. Yeah. But Jesus was saying, I am the way. He's the way. So how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we put that? Oh, when we speak to people who say there are other ways to God? <laughs> okay. So, um, I think that's kind of what Father Joseph was saying when we got in that conversation about the universalism and all that. And he was telling this story about Bishop Basil, who said, um, no one will be in heaven who's not a Christian, in the sense that when they come face to face with him, he's the door into the kingdom. He's the way. Whether you knew him in this world or not, he's the way. So, um, we have the opportunity, knowing Him, 
to already be entering through that door. Somebody who lives on some desert island who never heard of Jesus didn't have the same opportunity, but that doesn't mean he's not the way for them. He's still the way for them. Um, and what we pray and what we hope is that whatever they did know, whatever enlightenment they received from God, you know, however distantly, there's still truth in the world, there's still light that comes from God, that that will have prepared their heart to meet Him, and when they meet Him, to recognize Him as the way. You're the one I always wanted. C.S. Lewis puts it like that somewhere, you know, that, I, I like the idea, you know, in the end there are only two types of people, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, Thy will be done. So it's really, you know, what are you going to, when you come face to face with Him, now, it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter that we know Him now, it does, because we need all the help we can get, and, and we, ideally, we want to spend our whole life preparing to come face to face with Him, and we do that already. We, we, face, we come face to face with Him every time we pray, every time we receive communion, every time we make confession. We're not only practicing for that, we're doing it. We're standing there at the judgment throne with Him now. We don't have to put it off. If you don't have that, if you don't have the church, it's less certain. How are you going to respond, you know? Hopefully we're really learning well to respond and say, Yes, Lord, Thy will be done. What, I want to be with You no matter what. You know, as opposed to trying to justify, trying to make excuses, trying to, you know, blame. She made me do it. He made me do it, you know? Why, you know, desert island guy, why, did, why are you so mean to your wife? He could say, it's her fault, blah, blah, blah. Or he could say, Lord, I don't know you, but I know I can see you now. And you're, you're the Lord. And forgive me for the way I treated my wife. It was wrong. That's what we pray for, and that's what we believe is possible. no one comes to the Father except through me. Through me. But he doesn't say when, you know. In other words, it's going to be through him no matter what. He's the one who sits on the judgment throne, you know. Everybody will stand before him. And every There's no repentance after death, right? I thought that's yeah. what Father Honeycutt said. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that when you get there and see, oh, but you're saying, it sounds like you're saying, no one's going to go, oh, you're Jesus. They're going to go, oh, that's who you were, and I didn't know that that was your name, but I saw you, I saw you in the stars, or I saw you when I was sad that I hurt my wife's feelings, and yep. now I see that that's you. The voice of the conscience, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, you're why I didn't think, oh, I felt icky about that, you know? Because you're the Logos. Now I see, you know, how, what everything means, you know. Um, yeah. And, uh, that would be, I, I knew I hated you, but now that I see you, that would be repentance, and that won't happen after death. Well, so the way, one way that that's described is we get on a particular trajectory um, between now and our death, and, and so at our death, that trajectory will continue. But it doesn't, we could not be very far along the trajectory, but at least if we're turned towards the light, then everything else is possible. But if we've absolutely rejected the light, then we're just going to go on deeper into darkness, if that makes sense. But we say, yeah, I mean, somebody who didn't you know, fully know Christ can still be oriented towards the light, wanting Him. It's Him that they're really wanting in all of their yearning. They just don't know Him yet, you know? Just like if we come to the native somewhere and we bring the gospel, we say, this is the one you're looking for. We don't say, you're all bad and wrong and everything like that. We say, everything good about your faith is oriented towards this one. He's the fulfillment of it, Jesus, you know? So yeah, I mean, we say, um, not that repentance is possible after death, but that if one has even a grain of repentance, it's possible to receive God's mercy. And it's hard for me even to imagine. That's why Bishop Basil says, you have to really want hell. <laughs> you know, because he's so merciful. You have to really hate God a lot. But I mean, I think most people, even Christ says on the cross, they don't know what they're, the ones who are crucifying him, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. The ones who are crucifying him. So that, to me, it says there's hope for those guys 
And if there's hope for them, maybe there's hope for me too, you know, and for whoever else. That's good.